before I make some opening comments, I'd like to ask uh, Senator Hewitt, who was really the, um, I won't use the word instigator, but the, the parent, if you will, of lost STEM. So, Senator. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rallo, uh, for giving me an opportunity to officially kick off this journey. And I want to start by saying how excited I am to see so many of you here. And I appreciate the commitment that you all have shown in helping us resource this activity. You know, I believe that today is going to go down in history as a turning point for the state of Louisiana. Because today is the day that we're going to make a decision to take concrete steps to making Louisiana an international leader in the area of STEM. Today's the day that that's going to happen. And you all are all going to be part of that. In doing so, we're going to provide an opportunity for the citizens of Louisiana to get the skills they need to get high paying jobs in the area of STEM. And we're also going to build the engine that the state of Louisiana needs long term for economic stability. And although we can't discount the importance of art and the other programs in helping to make our community more well rounded, I think we would be remiss and not recognizing how technology is changing all around us. And it is so integrated in our everyday lives that we would, we would be missing a tremendous opportunity if we didn't take advantage and participate in the changing technology. This is not going to be easy. And as Dr. Rallo mentioned, you know, we have an interesting cast of characters as part of this group. And it was very strategic in that half of you represent uh, parts of the education area, and the other half represents industry. And because I see this as a very equal partnership. And what you're going to find, even though many of you, it has been pointed out to me, some of you maybe don't necessarily always agree on issues, and you might find yourselves normally on opposite sides of of some of these issues. STEM is the exception. Everyone loves STEM. STEM crosses all demographics, all political boundaries, because I believe STEM represents hope and it represents opportunity. And it's something that everybody loves. It probably was the most bipartisan bill that we passed in this last session. Many of you are already partnering in great STEM activities happening around the state. And I don't want to discount any of the work that you're already doing. And part of what you're going to hear about today is our objective is to learn about all the great things happening already in the area of STEM and to figure out those things that we want to expand upon and maybe take statewide. The partnerships are already happening between industry and education, and they're critical. I mean, I see industry as the ultimate stakeholder. Industry, are the, you are the ones that are providing the jobs and are driving the economy and are providing money, basically, to allow our families to prosper. Funding is going to be an important part of this initiative. <clears throat> And as we gain more clarity on the direction that this council chooses to go, you know, we are going to be depending initially on funding from industry to help us get focused until we are sustainable enough and can demonstrate some results to be able to seek uh, state funding. <clears throat> now, I'd like to give a, a shout out, and for those of you who have read the bill already, you know that part of the bill <clears throat> discusses an interest in increasing the number of women in STEM. And you know, there's a lot of talk in the country about equal pay. <clears throat> and I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about that. You know, the statistic that quite often gets quoted says in Louisiana that women get paid 65% of what a man gets paid. <clears throat> the distinction that you need to have with that particular statistic 
is that that is not talking about equal pay for equal work, that particular statistic from the AAUW. <clears throat> what that statistic quotes is the median male earner in Louisiana compared to the median female earner in Louisiana, <clears throat> where the woman makes 65% of what the man makes. So as you math teachers know, and those of you with the technical backgrounds, you know that median means if you lined up all of the men from the highest paid to the lowest paid and selected the, the man standing in the middle of the line and you did the same thing with the women and you compared them, the female would be making 65% of what the male makes. So that is more a result, that disparity in my opinion, and it, I think literature supports this, that disparity is more a result of the careers that women have chosen more so than the fact you're not comparing, again, equal pay and equal work. So the careers that women are choosing in most cases are not in those high paying fields like STEM that we're talking about. And so I firmly believe that STEM and a focus on STEM for women is a way to close the pay gap. And so that's part, that is the driver for me in focusing and trying to provide some extra emphasis for women in STEM. Many of you know my background and you know that I, I'm a mechanical engineer by background. I started out my first year on a, on a drilling rig <clears throat> back in the early 80s when women really were not uh, very prevalent in the drilling industry. And so times were tough. And uh, every now and then I, I get conned into uh, telling you know, some of the stories about back in the day how things were. And <clears throat> like many of you, you know, I juggled how to balance work and family. And um, as I kind of earned my stripes, I think, and, and built some credibility with, with that group and became very successful in executive management with that company, <clears throat> you know, I began to learn the, um, the value of STEM. And I felt like, and I believe that many women feel this way, that I was not, I did not want to be given anything other than an opportunity to be treated fairly and to be judged based on my performance. And so I believe that women around the state and around the country feel that way too. And we just need to be able to give them hope and we need to show leadership and mentorship. And so I'm kind of sending out a little bit of an all call here for female leaders around the state. I believe you will have a role in this process, in mentoring and being a role model for young girls to show them that women can be successful in the area of STEM. Our charge, in short, and you'll hear many more details later in the agenda with Dr. Rallo's staff, but our charge, in short, is to build a pipeline of STEM talent. And the pipeline starts with creating an interest in STEM at early ages, developing the skills in those students so that they're STEM ready, putting them in situations where they can be successful in a STEM career, and then connecting the dots with workforce where they have terrific job opportunities. <clears throat> and this wouldn't be a, uh, a Sharon Hewitt presentation without a few statistics. And so I want to give you a few numbers that helped drive me um, in terms of the case for action for this bill. In the area of interest, the beginning of the pipeline, in Louisiana they have done uh, some surveys and they have learned that the interest in STEM in males has increased in the last 10 years from 41 percent to 47 percent, which is slightly above the national average. However, over that same period, the interest in STEM in females has decreased from 16 percent to 13 percent and is below the national average. In terms of readiness, when we survey all Louisiana students, 52% of them say that they have an interest in STEM, 
but only 14% of them are STEM ready based on ACT scores. And just to allow you to calibrate that, the leading states, and I'm gonna name Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire, are closer to 50-50 in terms of the interest and the STEM readiness measurements. So we have a little work to do in Louisiana. We talked about women earlier. Women graduates are extremely underrepresented in Louisiana in some key technical fields. In engineering, we're graduating 84% male graduates in engineering, 16% are female, which by the way is not much different than when I graduated a few years back. In physics, the numbers are 88% male, 12% female. This is all in the state of Louisiana. In computer science, the fastest growing field in the nation, 77% male, 23% female. There are many other states that see the great opportunities and the need for STEM and to, to focus on technology. As a matter of fact, seven governors this last year, two years ago when they were sworn in in their 2017 State of the State addresses, highlighted new programs in their states that were focused on STEM, particularly in the area of computer science. So we have lots of competition out there. You know, when you look at, even recently in the news, you all read about Amazon op opening up kind of a bidding war around the country. And I've read a lot of those articles. Why, you, you know, you know, Amazon is starting a second headquarters. They're talking about 50,000 jobs at the second headquarters at an average annual salary of $100,000. So you ask yourself, why are they not staying in Seattle and just expanding? That would be an easy thing to do. And what I have read in the newspaper says that they can't find enough STEM talent anymore in Seattle because they're competing with companies like Microsoft and Apple. And so the pundits are already developing a short list of, of cities and states that could compete for Amazon's second headquarters based on their STEM talent, STEM availability. That's a great example of, of one of many companies and industries that are gonna be looking for STEM talent and I believe that Louisiana needs to be in a position to be a leader in that area so that we can be the go-to state for STEM. So in conclusion, I, I would like to say that, you know, I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to know that if you aren't participating in technology, you will be left behind. There's great examples of STEM and technology happening all around us that I have been part of over the last few weeks. And now that I'm kind of becoming the STEM queen, you can imagine how much my email is melting down with lots of folks wanting to share success stories. And we're going to begin hearing some of those in future meetings, STEM success stories from all around the state. You know, I've been part of FIRST Robotics and seen, as a matter of fact, I sponsored a a robotics day at the Capitol this last session. We called it the Festival de Robotique and had uh, two to 300 students from all around the state here, K through 12, showing their stuff in the area of robotics and competing. And uh, what a joy and what an amazing group of students we have in our state. I spent time up in Shreveport, Bossier area recently with the Cyber Innovative Center and CSRA and Louisiana Tech and Bossier Parish. And it was so exciting to see those leaders working across management system boundaries to deliver a workforce for a brand new industry, cyber technology, and developing curriculums and what have you to deliver that because it was a need. It was so exciting, and to see, did not get to see the students, but I've seen video of, of the camps and what have you, and the, the kids are loving it. I spent some time in Lafayette recently working with CGI and all of the high-tech work that they're doing and their relationship with UL, and it's very exciting. And so I hope that, that you share my enthusiasm and see the case for action in building STEM in Louisiana, 
because I believe that our students want STEM. I believe that our industries demand STEM, and I think that it's our job to deliver it. So thank you all very much for being here and being part of this journey with me. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Hewitt. And before I go over the agenda, because I know I've sat where you've sat many times, and there's nothing worse than saying, what the heck are they going to do for the next hour and 45 minutes? But we have a lot of things planned, and I'm going to go through that, and I think you're going to be pleased with that. And I do want to make a couple of observations of my own to sort of echo the Senator's point. But I do want to acknowledge our board chair. I think I see Mr. Lipsy somewhere out there. Right there. I just want to acknowledge the fact that he's here for our board, board of Regents chair in terms of that. Um, just, just two, two quick little stories, just to put in perspective. I think oftentimes we are informed by our own life experiences, and some of you, many of you may know that I spent probably about 30 years in the military, and I'll give you two examples. Uh, we were in the middle of nowhere, and uh, one of my um, enlisted uh, non-commissioned officers came up to me, and he said, uh, he said, sir, you know, 20 years ago, I'd be stringing wire here for communications, and all you needed really was a strong back and a good work ethic. And he said, now I've got to link up with the satellites. I've got to worry about angles. I've got to take math that I never even knew existed. And here was a man with a high school education, but at the same time was engaged in the types of activities that are defining the future. My own background, I was in the intelligence field, and I remember in 1981 when I was commissioned in the Navy, I had a number two pencil. That was my high-tech device to begin to develop plans for pilots to avoid certain parts of, of the airspace that they shouldn't be in. And <clears throat> when I retired in 2008 as a colonel, I was taken to a facility and I was looking real time with drones uh, over places in the desert, allowing linguists to interact with technology people to interact with pilots. So technology is with us. And so let me make a couple of observations and then we'll go to the agenda. The first is that STEM represents constant change. I mean, that is a given. Uh, it is going to change, it's continuing to change. And that leads to the second point, is that if we don't engage in this activity, the world is not going to stop and wait for Louisiana to catch up. And even if we do engage in this activity, everyone around us is doing so at the same pace or perhaps even better, or uh, even faster. We live in an extraordinarily competitive environment. There are good things to the end of it, but at the same time, we have to be competitive. And the third observation, um, when, I, when I, taught, uh, uh, I taught international business, and one of the things we always talk about is no borders. STEM represents no borders. There was no such thing as STEM for the regions or the parishes or STEM for the state or STEM for the nation or STEM for the world. STEM is basically captures everything, and we need to acknowledge that uh, as we move forward. And I'm also a former business professor and business dean. I always like to start with a number the senator alluded to, but I want you to think about <clears throat> these two numbers as we begin to inform our conversations. The first is Dr. Barnes, who is our economist at LSU, uh, Stephen Barnes, who does a great job, and he projects workforce, uh, and he works with our workforce colleagues, et cetera. And uh, this is for Louisiana. I'm not talking about outside of Louisiana or those strange places like where I came from, New York City, but I mean Louisiana. Four and five star jobs, and we're going to talk a little bit about those. Those are high wage, high demand jobs. And this is not to diminish or to denigrate individuals who can't compete for those, but we're focusing on high wage, high demand jobs, four and five star jobs. 58% of those in Louisiana will require some background in STEM. And 40% of all jobs in our state will require some background in STEM. And as I was joking earlier, uh, I, my undergraduate degree is in Russian history and I grew up in a STEM light household. Uh, we have to change those things. So the first number to think about is 58% and 40%. And then the second number the Senator alluded to, but we just got actually last week um, on Wednesday, uh, the latest AT, ACT scores. And 10% of Louisiana graduates are currently ready to meet the STEM workforce needs. So you have 58%, you have 40%, and you have 10%. In any way of thinking about that, that is a gap analysis, and that's what this group is all about. Now the nice thing is that there is, if you will, good news at the end of this process, uh, but at the same time we need to recognize, as I said before, it is a process that if we don't engage in it, not only are we gonna be left behind, we're gonna get run over. 
So let me run through the agenda very, very quickly over here. And is it behind us, I think, hopefully? There we go. Okay. Uh, just what we're going to do, we're going to uh, have a roll call because this is a statewide committee. Uh, Dr. Subramanian is around here somewhere. She will administer the oath of office, and I believe you have that on the front of you uh, on, the, on your table, so you can go ahead and, and fill that out. We're going to briefly review uh, Act 392 to highlight uh, some of the uh, outcomes and also some of the activities. And as Senator Hewitt mentioned, I mean, we're not diminishing the concept of STEAM, you know, which is the arts, but we are basically hewing to what this act has requiring, which is to focus on STEM. Then I think we're going to really get into some interesting, uh, interesting uh, activities. Um, we are going to have a presentation, what we're calling an environmental scan. We've been working very long and hard, my staff has, I just sort of wander around aimlessly, but they've been collecting the stories of STEM throughout the state, and there are incredible stories. There are pockets, but there are incredible stories, and we want you to see some of the activities that are out there, and it might engender in your mind some things that we need to go. We will start looking at some quarterly and annual goals because we are an outcomes-oriented group. We are not simply here to share with each other, although with sharing is good, but we are focused on outcomes, and so we'll create some goals. And then we've already gone ahead and established some, uh, I think it's either four or five subcommittees headed by one of my staff members, all of whom are very talented and very bright, and they're going to get up and talk a little bit about what questions, activities, and concepts live in their box, and their box might be K through 12, might be workforce, it might be that. So you begin to see the types of things that are being done, but also many of the questions that need to be asked. And then we'll have an open discussion, because that's what it's all about. You know, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're covering all the bases. And the last thing, we'll talk about some funding concepts, and then obviously other business. We'll also give you your uh, calendar, if you will, for the year, because we have set this up so that I know uh, that you can't make every meeting. I respect that. But at the same time, this way you can put them on the calendar. And hopefully you'll become so excited that you're going to say my entire month is focused on going to that STEM meeting. And everything else diminishes, including the holidays. They pale in comparison with STEMness, if you will, or STEM. STEMness. STEMness. So having said that, if Dr. Supermanian could come forward wherever she is and admin oh, there she is. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. And while you're doing that, we're going to do a roll call. Hello. And hopefully, uh, I've introduced myself to almost everyone, so hopefully if I, if I butcher your name, you'll forgive me this time and we'll make our best time. So I'll start with uh, the Commissioner of Higher Education, Dr. Rollo. Yep. Um, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, David Lewis, yes. Representative. Um, Superintendent of Education, John White. The Economic Development Designee, Susan Schoen. Uh, Did I say that right? Schoen. Schoen. I got you. Economic <coughs> Development Appointee, Carrick and Abbott. Here. Thank you. Um, economic Development Appointee, Tom Ura. Here. Economic Development Appointee, Ken Tucker. Here. Uh, faculty Designee, Dr. Mayar Amusaga. Yeah. I said that right there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, LCTCS System designee Dr. William Wainwright. Here. Um, Louisiana Federation of Teachers, Mr. Larry Carter, Jr. Okay. Louisiana School Boards Association designee Dr. Janet Pope. Here. Louisiana Science Teachers Association, Mr. Nathan Cotton. Here. LSU System Representative Dr. Randy Duran. Here. Uh, Senator Sharon Hewitt. Here. Southern University System Representative, Dr. Rachel Vincent Finley. Here. Um, Uni University of Louisiana System President, Dr. James Henderson. Here. Workforce Commission, Ms. Ava DeJoy. Here. DeJoy. 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 You one get out of jail for <laughs> uh, Workforce Investment Council Representative, Mr. Todd McDonald. Here. Thank you. Faculty Designee, Ms. Laura Younger. Here. Uh, Governor's appointee, Dr. Calvin Mackey. Here. Governor's appointee, Ms. Kristen Reed. Here. Governor's appointee, Ms. Jamie Williams. Here. Representative Stephanie Hilferty. Here. Louisiana Association of Biz Business and Industry, Mr. Michael Gaudet. Here. Louisiana Association of Educators, Ms. Crystal Williams Gordon. Here. Louisiana Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, Dr. Stanton <coughs> McNeely. Here. Louisiana Association of Principals, Mr. Scott Stevens. Here. Louisiana Association of Public Charter Schools, Dr. Patty Glazier. Here. 
and Louisiana Association of Teachers in Mathematics, Ms. Trisha Miller. Here. Thank you. So, again, as uh, Dr. Luma comes out to call the votes of office, if you can just sign, if you have it, the document in front of you so we can get that sent to the Secretary of State, that'd be great. Right. Uh, I have your name. Joseph right. Drawler. Sure, you Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. swear. That I will. That I will. Support the constitutional laws of the United States. Support, Support the, the constitutional, constitutional laws, laws of the United States. States. And the constitutional laws of the state. And, and the, the constitutional, constitutional laws of the state. state. And that I will. And, and that, that I, I will. Faithfully and impartially. Faithfully and impartially. Discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties incumbent upon me as. All the duties incumbent upon me as. A member of. STEM Council, member of the Louisiana STEM Council, according to the best of my ability and understanding. According to the best of my ability and understanding. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Great. Please fill out the form and leave it where you where you're seated, and it'll be collected later. Thank you. Thank you. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through the very very briefly the act. Let me also congratulate you when I was years I spent in the military, I was at the Air Force Academy and the faculty, and we would commission the, uh, the young uh, cadets, and they always wanted to be commissioned one minute after midnight of the day they were going to get uh, commissioned, and as you can imagine, perhaps their, their skill sets have been diminished by some adult entertaining, so it was always very interesting, I would have to do one word at a time, so it was like, I, you know, state, your, it took a lot longer than it did here, but anyway, let me go through Act 392 uh, to give you again the high points, and this once again is not to diminish anything else that is going on in the state with respect to higher education, K-12 workforce, but it is rather to focus on what we are looking at with respect to this legislation. First off, objectives, core, and this is all, all of this stuff that we're going to see all online. We have a web page that will be set up, and we'll share that with you in a second, but I just want to share this. Objectives, coordinate, oversee the creation, the delivery, and the promotion of STEM education programs, and I know I don't have to say this, but STEM, obviously, is science technology. Uh, engineering mathematics. Increase the student interest and achievement in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Ensure the alignment of education, economic development, industry, and workforce needs. I think this is, as Senator Hewitt mentioned, probably one of the most powerful opportunities for this committee where we can bring everyone together, create a pipeline, as opposed to people doing sort of discrete projects of activity. Increase the number of women who graduate from a post-secondary <coughs> institution with a STEM degree or credential. My daughter, who will be 34 years old, graduated many years ago. She did pre-med and theater. What do you think she's doing now? She's in L.A. trying to break into the theater. More power to her, but at least she can always fall back on the pre-med. So we're looking now at women, and this obviously is also young girls. Establish a competitive grants program to fund providers' competition. These are one of the things that if and when, and I know it will be when, we are able to generate uh, uh, primarily private sector uh, dollars. We want to begin to look at uh, robotics competitions to enhance those that already exist, but also to create a statewide palette, if you look for these things. Notice they use the word palette. My wife is an artist, so I have to use the word artist, even though we're talking about the stand okay? um, What we're going to look at now is rather interesting. <coughs> I'm going to turn over to Mr. Dunn, Bernie Dunn, who's shortly. How, how long before you come down to that? A couple months. A couple months, okay. Yes. And tell us again in what field? Neurobiology. Neurobiology. So we have somebody who understands STEM in this, and at the same time he's going to walk us through what has what is going on in the state, which I think you're going to find very interesting. So again, I chose this very uh, creative slide to kind of introduce the topic. So as, he, as the commissioner said, there's a lot going on in the state already, a lot of pockets of things that we're looking for, and again, our that's efforts, a terrible room. I hopefully, we're going to coordinate these room. efforts you get to turn and, and yeah, centralized like source, because again, in the law, there's, uh, it's required that we have an information clearinghouse. So it's going to be a place on our website, on the region's website, where students can go, where educators, educators can go, parents can go to find where the STEM education programs, where are the <coughs> summer camps, where are the, the school programs, scholarships, and everything like that. So, Again, before, before I start, this list is not comprehensive. If there is something on here that I, if there's something not on here, please feel free to share it with me because the goal of this, uh, the goal of our first couple months that you'll see is the, and when we talk about our goals is, is to gather as much information as possible. This is the information. Thank you if you sent information to me by email when I reached out to you. 
Um, hopefully it's up here, and if it's not, I get one get out of jail free card, and we'll talk about the rest later. So, I wanted to start with events, because there are a lot of, in various uh, cities, and these are just in New Orleans, I believe, there are a lot of events that are centered around bringing students from K-12 to some place to do STEM events, and it's ex exhibitions, to do experiments, and things like that. And I just wanted to point out a couple of them. Um, Core Element is an, uh, it's a group in New Orleans. They work with a lot of um, industry professionals. They do a lot of STEM teacher training, and I'll talk about that later. But they also do a lot of events, like the STEM Community Fest, where they partner with the Saints and the Pelicans to get kids to come out and meet the players, as well as participate in STEM projects. And we have the Greater New Orleans Science and Engineering Fair, I believe, that's sponsored by Tulane. And then Intergy has, a, has some events, uh, has some things that they do at a project called STEM NOLA. One of those events is STEM Saturdays that they do, and Dr. Calvin Mackey is actually here and he wants to talk about that later. But I just want to point out some of the events that we have and some of the things we want to continue to do and do in more places than just uh, more of them in groups to get students and parents excited about STEM and engaged in STEM. So, uh, in the doctor, in the commissioner's journey, he's he discovered that the World War II Museum, the National World War II Museum, has a STEM program. It was very interesting. It, it involves a week-long summer seminar for students. There's a robotics challenge, so an annual event for students to build robots and compete for some prizes. And then there's also, as you can imagine, STEM field trips. So uh, parents or teachers can organize groups of students to come and visit the World War II Museum and participate in STEM activities. This one was interesting, particularly to me and the commissioner, because that's something you, I guess you wouldn't expect from a history place, to have STEM events. But this is an example of how there are many pockets of STEM things going on in the state that we want to bring to everyone's uh, attention. So um, STEM ecosystems, that's something that I've learned more about since I've been uh, doing this environmental scan. So it's, it's, kind of, it's a national uh, initiative, uh, but there are some pockets of STEM ecosystems here in the state. Here in Baton Rouge, we have the, East, the Foundation for East Baton Rouge School System, the BR STEM, BR STEM Network. There should be someone here to represent the network. Uh, Ms. Kim Fawcett, so she'll hopefully come up and talk about that. The Cyber Innovation Center and Cyport Center are also STEM <coughs> systems where there's big uh, facilities for students and parents to come and be engaged in STEM and do exhibitions and things like that. Um, so these are just a couple of examples. I, mean, I think, I'm sure there's more, and then nationally there's a lot of them. This is just a couple of examples that we have here. If I'm talking too fast, again. Okay. So, um, the superintendent of uh, education sent me, uh, reminded, notified me of these K-12 pathways. I have to make sure they're all here. So these are pathways, uh, from my understanding, uh, uh, for engaging students in STEM at the K-12 level and transition into workforce careers or train them for workforce careers um, when they graduate from the programs. They're all unique. They all have their own outline, um, uh, outline objectives. Um, they involve internships, courses, training, as I said. Um, one in particular, pre-engineering pathway is a partnership with LSU where uh, the students would take engineering classes at LSU, so they would graduate with this pathway from high school and already be uh, you know, ahead of the game when they get to their engineering program at LSU. And just an example of on the last, uh, all of these are published online, but just want to point one of them out. All of these have an outline pathway that uh, shows how these credentials in this program can lead to uh, a career in the workforce. How did that okay. So my PhD advisor told me many times, if you want to put people to sleep, put a bunch of words on the screen. I put a bunch of words on the screen, not because I want to put you to sleep, but because there's so much information. So bear with me. I've highlighted the words I want you to pay attention to in red, because red gets everybody's attention. So I just want to go through some of these things and point out the consistency. So some of the, in these pockets, a lot of different places are doing the same thing. So I use a different color, it's very creative. I use a different color to point out these things so you can see some the similarities. 
So there are way too many K, uh, high schools and lower schools in the state to name, so I just picked, I guess, 10, picked a couple of them. Um, the Kenilworth Science and Technology School, the PFT Science and Technology School, and then the University Lab School, um, I don't know if Mr. Smith is here, the principal, but they also, if, if there isn't, there are a bunch of schools with STEM in their name, and STEM in their agenda and their uh, objectives. But there are also a lot of schools that participate in <coughs> national and international, that send students to participate in national and international events and have uh, middle school STEM clubs, STEM labs, robotics competitions. That's a theme that you'll see throughout this presentation and hopefully you'll see, we'll see more of this uh, with our work. So high school recruiting, and I, I call it this because these are mainly summer programs garnered for are 11th graders, 12th graders, or graduating seniors to get some involvement or some experience um, in STEM on a college campus. So I separated them by systems. And again, this is incomprehensive, so if I left it off, just send me a nice email to remind you. So the LSU system has a program for engineers, a couple programs for engineers, as you can imagine, the engineering program at LSU is rather uh, large. There are also some programs for recruiting minorities into mathematics, minorities into engineering, um, women into engineering, which is you know, outlined specifically in the law. Uh, the UL system has a, bunch, uh, a lot of programs. The engineering advancement program, I know we mentioned uh, we're focusing on STEM, but this is a STEAM discovery program, including the arts, um, computer science, physical science, Academy, summer enhancement in, in, in math. I know the commissioner spoke of uh, our ACT scores and there are a lot of pockets of math enrichment programs around the state that we can uh, give more attention to and, and of course expand if we, if possible. A pre-freshman academy at, uh, for freshmen uh, interested in math, or to increase mathematical literacy, sorry. The Southern System as well has some programs at the Timbuktu Academy, critical thinking and math, a robotics and sensors camp, again, robotics, uh, college summer, summer STEM program, engineering institute, transportation and energy institute, and I'm sorry to put that at the bottom, that's not just because of space. Um, there's also a STEM camp at BRCC and this. I'm sure more than that, but this is just to give you an idea of how there are pockets of <coughs> events and activities around the state for, for students to, be, uh, to get into STEM. And then in the private university, so uh, I am a product of a private undergraduate university, uh, I'll talk about it in a second. At Dillard, there's a pre-freshman engineering where they start recruiting, in a sense, students in the early as seventh grade to be interested in, in engineering. And I guess, you know, as we'll see, the earlier that we can engage, you know, these students in these programs, hopefully, the more likely they'll, they'll stick with it. Tulane University has a lot, has a big STEM program. They have a lot of things that they sponsor that they host on campus, that they work with community partners to put on. Um, these are just a few of them. The Perry Initiative is a national initiative that they participate in, uh, recruiting women to engineering and uh, medicine. Uh, the girls in STEM, starting with grades, uh, fifth grade, and the boys at Tulane in STEM, to use a very catchy name to get everybody's attention to come and participate. My alma mater, Xavier University, there's a plethora of summer programs um, there for students interested in STEM, and particularly minority students, but it's there. We have students come from all over the country. I actually was the program coordinator for the Super Scholar Excel program, and we had students from, the, uh, from Puerto Rico, from Alaska, from all over the world to come to Xavier to engage in um, STEM activities. And these that I've highlighted down here, these are specifically for students with proficient, uh, deficiencies in those subjects, so you can go to participate in a three or four week long program to specifically focus on those skills to prepare you for the next school year. And so undergraduate and graduate degree, so these are programs federally funded uh, by either National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, or both on college campuses. So these are for <coughs> undergraduates majoring in STEM degrees, I think it's primarily minorities and women in STEM degrees and also graduate students. So Howard Hughes is a summer program that allows students, I'm sure some of you know, that allows students to participate in research programs on LSU campus but also around the country. 
So basically, they apply for this, and if they receive the stipend, they can go to whatever school they want to do STEM research for a summer, or however many summers they're eligible. Um, LA STEM, so this is for undergraduates, diversity students in STEM. There's also a uh, graduate student component. So my first fellowship was the, uh, this next one. This next one, my first fellowship was an NSF uh, fellowship for bridge to doctorate. So it covers the first two years of your PhD career. But there's also funding for undergraduates to participate or to receive this funding. And it's great that all of these schools have students that are participating in this, in this program. Um, the Bristol Baccalaureate also is a NIH-funded uh, program. A lot of NIH's programs, as you'll see, are mainly focused on biomedical sciences, but still, this is part of the STEM um, topic, and this is something that's relevant to what we're trying to, to do. And Mark and RISE are two other programs at uh, Xavier. Um, I also actually hosted some students from the Mark program at Xavier, and kind of picks them at an early career, gets them interested in PhDs in the biomedical or STEM field, and it coaches them all throughout their undergraduate career. It's, uh, it's individualized helping, uh, individualized career coaching, um, college visits, campus visits around the country, resume work, all kind of things to help prepare them for graduate school and for STEM careers. So um, teacher training, we have um, Dr. Burns is going to come up and talk about uh, STEM teacher training, but this is just some things that I found throughout the state. LSU has a college readiness program to so a summer workshop to train teachers in um, algebra, geometry, and AP calculus. I believe when you finish, you get a cert certification in the subject. Um, the Math and Science Institute. So this isn't about me, but one more thing. I went to I did a country day for high school. It's a private school in Old Metairie. But they're also, they also have a uh, program for training students that the, the teacher, the people that teach the program are teachers from Country Day, but it's hosted at Tulane. Uh, NOLA Smile, oops. Uh, NOLA Smile and Smile Center for Science and Mathematics and the rest of it. We're always focused on science and mathematics. Just follow the right words. Um, Code.org, actually, I just found out about this recently. We have a representative here who may talk about it. But they have a grant to go around to travel and teach teachers how to code, and then in turn, the teachers teach their students through uh, uh, the activities that, that they provide. So that's something that we'd like to incorporate. You'll see that again because there's a national, there's, there's other national initiatives involved in getting women and underrepresented minorities involved in coding and, uh, and IT and technology. And then core element, again, is that they have uh, a couple summers uh, STEM programs to teach, to train teachers, but this is just one of them that I've highlighted for this. So to get back to the national initiative, so I've directed your attention with bright, shiny arrows to the ones I'm going to talk about. Girls Who Code is, a, is an initiative that Girls can sign up, girls who are interested in learning how to code can sign up through this program and they'll pay for you to go to various sites for a summer or for, right, to go to various sites for a summer and learn how to code. So this is something that's, that's, uh, that has a lot of involvement, a lot of movement around it, and I think it's something that, there's a couple of high schools that are participating in it, so I didn't list the high schools that are in the program to show that they're involved. The Girl Scout thing is, uh, it was actually announced uh, maybe a month ago, about there are now Girl Scout STEM badges. So all of the parents who have girls, who have daughters that are involved with Girl Scouts, there's now ways to get STEM badges. So another way to get um, young women interested, young girls interested in STEM. And then first robotics. So um, Senator Hewitt mentioned uh, <coughs> success stories that we're going to talk about. And I think uh, at either the next meeting or the one after, first robotics is going to be here to talk about the plethora of uh, competitions and activities and involvement they have, not only in Louisiana, but around the uh, country. And these are some other initiatives. Um, again, these are national initiatives that students in particular high schools are participating in. Um, Science Olympiad, Engineering is Elementary, just to get more students engaged in STEM as early as possible. So, as, again, as the commissioner pointed out, we are 
driven by outcomes. So a, a big part of that is pointing out the benchmark. So there are some, I've selected a few uh, states that, are, that already have the ball rolling on this. Um, the Children Now Network, the uh, California STEM Network, I'm not sure if Mr. Chris is here, but he may come up and, and talk about that as well. It's gonna be uh, helping us out in our initiatives. But particularly I want to talk about the Iowa STEM Council. They started in 2011. Um, so they have, you know, they've been doing this for a while. I've spoken to a couple of their administrators. They have a lot of great programs and working groups. Um, and I wanted to put this up here because this is, as the commissioner mentioned, as we separate into working groups, we can, we're able to expand that as much as possible. We're able to choose whatever initiatives we want to come to fruition as much as, uh, as, much as we can. Um, program evaluation is gonna be very important, making sure that, uh, for example, teacher training programs, making sure that it's not just, you know, maybe a one day thing, maybe making sure teachers are attending and following up and using their training. Um, the Microsoft IT Academy, I didn't put a slide up for it, but I just wanted to mention, there is an NSF grant that will fund things like this that I'm working on, uh, along with the Commission of Sponsored Programs. And it's for, it's part of it is for after school program, which we'll, we'll talk about. But part of it will be for the, hopefully, for the Microsoft IT Academy. And what that is, is, again, similar to the code.org, so Microsoft gives you licenses to their products and it trains the teachers on coding and things like that, and then the teachers incorporate that into the lesson plans. So these are just some ideas of things we can do, of, of places we can take it. Um, I believe the, uh, also in the law, some other things like the seal or the high school diploma, that's something that, that they do as well. So this is just to give you an idea of another state that's, that's doing what we're about to do and hopefully set some, uh, some goals for us. Good. That's all I got. Good. Okay, that's good. And uh, let me now go to room, uh, Roman uh, 6 and 7, <coughs> and we can move again towards our uh, work group. So, six, I, I committed to Senator Hewitt that uh, we would uh, staff this proposal for at least a year, uh, and uh, because it is vitally important to the state. So we have some goals, if you want to say. Do we have a goal up there or not? Just, uh, then before this. Oh, goals. Yeah. Okay. So. We are one to three months, in other words, so this is the first of the three months we are doing what we're calling an environmental scan. Basically what you saw was what exists out there in Louisiana, what exists nationally. And this is not just to look at activities, but also, uh, as Mr. Gunn pointed out, to begin to look at some grant opportunities uh, that we can begin to uh, have a, a footprint that goes beyond just uh, the state. The next three, uh, three, go, three to six months, or four to six months, excuse me, really begin to develop some specific goals based upon what we're seeing we are doing well, based upon the holes and what we're missing, and, be, and to start to talk about how we can uh, sort of knit those together. Uh, in the legislation, we have our first report, thank you, Senator Hewitt, uh, due <laughs> January 13th. So these are not my, uh, my benchmarks, if you will, my goals. These are ones that we will meet, and at that point in time, we will at least be able to report on how far we have progressed, and I believe we'll have some successes. The next we have now is really from six to 12 months uh, as funding allowed. I firmly believe, as I said, I'm a former business dean, and there's nothing wrong with going out there with a great product and uh, asking for support. And I know that we will engage in that. I know that we'll be successful. So part of our conversation is going to be once we start generating these revenues, whether through funding sources or private sector sources, how then will we begin to allocate those against the goals uh, that we have anticipated or have defined. So now uh, I'm going to move right to this subcommittees, and, and I think this you're going to find hopefully the most interesting, well, everything is interesting, obviously, but uh, the most interesting for the next 20 minutes. Uh, I can't do anything in life, but I can organize pretty much anything. <laughs> so what we have done is I've taken some very bright and talented people that work in the Board of Regents, and each of them is living in a box. And the boxes go from left to right, which are uh, pre-K through 12, uh, then higher ed, uh, community engagement, workforce, and then uh, communications and PR. We'll come back to fundraising in a moment. And each of them is going to come up, going to come up rather, and speak to you a little bit about what are the issues and opportunities and obstacles within their environment. And at the end of that, we're going to ask 
you all before you leave here uh, to volunteer to be in a box, and this also includes all our audience participants. Uh, you can volunteer for as many boxes as you want. We will share all the information, but if some of you are particularly interested in, for example, workforce, that's the place to go. So when this presentation is over, then you will have, I think, a pretty good idea of the environmental scan, pretty good idea of what types of issues and opportunities live within each box, and then we'll open it up uh, and we can talk about uh, ideas that we've missed, ideas that we should enhance, uh, personal success stories, uh, how you grew up in Freeport, we want to listen to that. But in the meantime, we're going to start doing these sorts of things. So let me start with going left to right, Dr. Burns. Thank you. My name is Jean Burns. I'm Associate Commissioner for Teacher and Leadership Initiatives within the Board of Regents. And I work with all of our universities on issues dealing with PK through 16 plus education. I'm going to be heading up the work group that is going to be dealing with PK through 12 um, education. And we're going to be looking at two specific areas that you saw listed up there. One is dealing with PK through 12 student learning. The other one is dealing with PK through 16 plus teacher quality. You're going to find as I go through and provide some information that there's still a lot of questions that need to be answered. For those of you who are not familiar with what we're doing in PK through 16 plus education, I'm going to give you some base knowledge. And for those of you who are very familiar, I'm going to be raising some questions that the work group will be looking at. And uh, we will be very interested in other questions that you also have that you feel should be addressed uh, if you're part of the work group. As we have been preparing for this advisory council, we have taken a look at research, we've taken a look at what's happening within the field, and we have found two common themes in research that are very, very important for the work that we're going to be doing. One is teachers play a critical role in <laughs> students' STEM career choices. That's very, very important. And then employing a hands-on approach sparks enthusiasm for students selecting a STEM career. When you look at the literature, you find that those teachers who are excited about teaching in the STEM field, where they're actively engaging the students within their classrooms in using resources and materials in the <laughs> STEM field, that that carries over into the enthusiasm that you see within children. Very, very, very important. In our state, we're fortunate because Bessie, under the leadership of Superintendent John White and Jada Lewis, Bessie has created new standards that have just been approved in the area of science this year and in the area of mathematics and English language arts last year. I served on the steering committees as those standards were developed, and I have to say that teachers and other educators within our state did a tremendous job to help to ensure that children within our state are going to have to address the very highest standards, especially in the area of science, uh, math as well, as well as English language arts. But in the area of science, there are some radical changes that are going to have to be occurring in our classrooms as we move forward within the future in the STEM field. Uh, one of the uh, conversations that the educators had over and over again was that teachers, existing teachers as well as new teachers in our state, are going to need to have professional learning opportunities in order to engage students in critical thinking, in analyzing data, and not only are they going to need to have that professional learning opportunities, which is not a one-time workshop, but their children are going to have to have resources. They're going to have to have the materials in order for them to really be able to do hands-on types of activities that will help to generate that enthusiasm. So just to start off, just be aware, we have very good standards in place within our state. 
we now need to go to that next level where we are going to have materials, resources we can put into the hands of children, we can put into the hands of teachers, and the teachers can actually do the kind of teaching that is going to get the kids excited about moving into STEM fields. You have already heard from Vernon all of the different initiatives that, uh, you haven't heard them all, there's many, many, many. Uh, the, there's lots of initiatives going on within our state. What we have determined uh, is that as we're looking at these initiatives, we need to break them out so people are aware of what's appropriate for like PK through eight, for high school, for college students, for pre-service teachers, for in-service teachers, and for parents. And we don't need to just be listing, but we also need to have an understanding of which initiatives are actually working. Uh, which ones, uh, Dr. Rallo talked about 10% of students based upon ACT being ready for science or for STEM areas. We've got to figure out what is working. And then once we determine what is working, we need to then provide opportunities for students across our state to be able to have access to those opportunities as well. So with our work group, part of what we're going to be doing is taking a look at what are these different initiatives? Where is their evidence? We're gonna to have to collect it. We don't have it right now. But where is their evidence to show that there are initiatives that are truly impacting kids? that are truly impacting those students that are going into the STEM field. Uh, as far as uh, teacher quality is concerned, I've listed up there the various areas of certification that we currently have within our state that are in the STEM areas. Uh, for those of you who can't see it, it's biology, chemistry, computer science, earth science, environmental science, general science, mathematics, physics, and technology education. As we have been reviewing the literature, it's become apparent that there could be other areas of certification that we need to be looking at for the future as it relates to teacher education, teacher certification. In fact, Frank Newbrander, who's in our office, just in, in our audience, uh, at a meeting just last week, brought up mentioning several different other areas that might be very, very relevant and moving into such areas as dealing with cyber skills, robotics, engineering. And John talked about those K through 12 pathways. And as I was looking at those pathways, those were pre-engineering, they were robotics, there were a lot of different areas. We may find that in the current certification areas, that's already being addressed. But if it's not being addressed, then we need to open our minds to taking a look at what is it that we need for teacher certification that would address what it is that students now have as pathways in order for them to be ready for the STEM <coughs> fields. So this is something that our group needs to look at. Within teacher education, we currently have three pathways for teachers to become certified. We have undergraduate, we have alternate for people who have non-education degrees that want to come in and become te certified as teachers. And then for certified teachers, we have add-on certification, where you can add on an additional area of certification. With our undergraduate programs, many of you may not be aware that many of our <coughs> universities now require individuals to get a degree in like math in the College of Sciences and a minor in secondary education. So those individuals are coming out where they have a lot of career choices. It's not just teacher education. They can go into any other field dealing with math, chemistry, physics, and we really don't have a good grasp right now of how many students who are in these pathways are actually going into teacher education. So our work group is really going to need to take a look at how many students are being produced coming out of the STEM areas, how many of them are actually taking jobs in Louisiana in public schools, because our universities produce teachers for private schools as well. And then for our alternate pathways, the same thing, of those individuals who are getting uh, degrees, uh, not degrees, but they're getting certification through alternate pathways, are they staying or are they moving into some other area of certification? 
Uh, so we need, we, there's information we need there. And then the last one with add-on certification, that is, that is really kind of raised to become um, a lot of conversation lately about it. Within the past, there used to be state funds, 8G funds through Bessie, that would provide tuition for people to go back and add on areas of teacher certification so that if they were already certified in biology, they needed a depth of knowledge in chemistry, they could then get a BS in chemistry, from, not a BS, but a master's degree, an MS in chemistry, or through teacher education, they could get an MED with a concentration in whatever that area of certification is. They could then pass the licensure assessment, and they could become certified to teach. Those HG funds are no longer there. We actually had some legislation that indicated that if all of the AG funds were used up by districts, then universities needed to provide um, space uh, or allow students to be able to take uh, courses if there was room available within those courses without paying tuition. Again, we can't do that now because there is no tuition funds that teachers can use for the add-on certification. So that's an area that we need to start taking a look at. Is it now time for us to take a look at providing opportunities for teachers to add on, who are already certified, to add on areas of certification in the STEM fields? And then last, and I'm going to be real quick here, but we have new Bessie policy that will be implemented as of July 1st, 2018, that will require full year residencies for all new undergraduate students. And there will be mentor teachers that will be with those candidates throughout the year. This is an excellent opportunity for us to be training new teachers as well as experienced teachers who are mentors to be able to do really great uh, hands-on types of experiences, have the resources to be able to actually use them with children, and then even equally as important for those teacher candidates, for them to be able to take those resources with them into their teaching position in a public school so that they can then carry on what they've learned as they're using hands-on approaches in uh, working with children. So these are all areas that we're going to be looking at as part of this work group. There are other questions as well that need to be asked. But our intent is to be able to come up with some very clear recommendations for ways in which we can get students, as well as teachers, excited about the STEM field and to be actively engaged and involved in the STEM field. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Lemmer. Thank you so much, Dr. Rallo. I am currently working at the Board of Regents as a policy analyst. I'm um, a relative newcomer, having just joined um, the staff in, in January of this year. So my area, my box, is the higher education, which encompasses two-year and four-year. When Dr. Rallo charged us with this um, task, one of the things that I wanted to take a look at was to just take a temperature of what is going on nationally, what is the most current research uh, say with respect to STEM fields, the performance of women in STEM fields. And one particular study that I thought was really relevant, which was a very new study, a very respected National Bureau of Economic Research that just came out in August of 2017, looked at some of the factors that impact why females, why students, female students change their major out of STEM fields. And so it was very interesting because what the team explored was, and what they found was that it's a complex combination of factors, including lack of fit into major, which can include, you know, a young lady walking into a classroom and seeing that the classroom is, is full of male students, um, uh, gender stereotyping signals, and perceptions of majors and grades. So, you know, right at the outset, what this tells us is this, this is not just necessarily a readiness issue. While that is critical, it is also an environmental issue. So I think one of the, one of the issues that this particular group will need to work with is, you know, how do we change that narrative? How do we 
have more inclusive language that can be incorporated into the messaging that we give our students. Um, curiously enough, uh, again, I also was interested in investigating what were the majors that were more particularly male dominated and were female students. Uh, was there any, uh, any more female students that were in some particular STEM groups. So computer science, biophysics, and physics tend to be male dominated in this particular study. And neurobiology, environmental science, and biology of global health tended to be uh, female dominated. So I would be curious to perhaps take a look at some of the state, some of our schools, and see you know, how that breakdown works out. So let's talk about current pathways. I think Vernon did a fantastic job going over everything. But I want to just talk particularly about two opportunities that I, that I see that we currently have in place. And that is dual enrollment and two plus two agreements. Let me just briefly bring everybody up to date if, if you're not aware. Uh, dual enrollment is a program, it's a collaboration between high schools and institutions, two or four year, to provide courses where students can not only earn high school credit, but they also earn college credit. So you might have heard a lot about dual enrollment or dual credit. That is very much not only a state topic, a trending state topic, but a trending national topic. Uh, the other portion that I want to talk about that we currently have in place, and we have some very robust programs in place across the state, but again, we've got a, a, a status and we want to definitely, like Dr. Burns said, move the move it up a notch, um, are two plus two agreements. You'll hear those, and those are agreements between two-year institutions and four-year institutions that create a pathway for the two-year the two-year students to take courses that they know will specifically transfer to the four-year institution in um, a specific major. And so right now, we have those in the state, but again, we need to, we need to build those. Let's talk about challenges. You know, we all heard the, I like how Dr. Rallo said that, that we've got 10% of students that are eligible uh, based on their ACT scores to enter STEM fields. But that leaves us with 90% of students who are not necessarily ready to enter into a STEM field. And so I'm a very, I'm very much a half full person. Um, you know, so one of the things that we need to look at is, you know, what can we do? That the rigor of the foundational courses is a critical element to the success of students in STEM fields, particularly because these foundational courses set the base information for the students to be successful in subsequent courses. Um, you know, those students, those young ladies that perhaps are, uh, you know, changing their major out of STEM fields um, due to grades may be that they don't have the foundation necessary to be successful at the college level. Another point that is a challenge, but I think this is a challenge that can be overcome, the need for clarity of student advising at both the secondary and post-secondary levels. Um, and when I say clarity of student advising, you know, I, I say that with the understanding of how overwhelmed and burdened our uh, counseling staffs are across the state, both at the secondary and post-secondary levels. But there needs to be clear, uniform information that's given to students about their opportunities in STEM fields. Finally, funding for uh, initiatives and resources. I think I'm just basically telling you something that you already know in that. So let's just briefly look at opportunities. So I briefly alluded to informing students and parents about opportunities. I think one group of students that we have that we can literally start off right away with is those students that are enrolled in dual enrollment courses. We can connect with them and start to inform them right away about opportunities in STEM fields. Students that are enrolled in math and science, uh, in, uh, in dual enrollment can benefit from getting additional information from either the secondary institution or the post-secondary institution with respect to opportunities in STEM. Identifying specific pathways and discovering of additional opportunities, informing and advising students about necessary skill set for success in STEM. 
I think one of the, the most important issues, and having worked in, an, in, a, in a higher ed institution for over 25 years and having talked to lots of students, many times these students have no idea what they're getting into. And so I think it's critical to let the students know and their parents know this is, these are the types of skill sets that are necessary for success in STEM fields. Informing them and messaging those populations to let them know about what are opportunities, skill sets, inform them as much as possible. Um, develop strategies to reach out to military students. I think this is one area where uh, we can see some, some really great benefits. Um, you know, military students that are coming back after active duty would probably have some of that skill set that is necessary for success in STEM majors. So maybe having some targeted programs at the two-year and four-year institutions where institu military students would be assisted. Now the long-term policy, establish policies that are supportive to um, and incentivize these opportunities for STEM. Uh, for example, um, you know, establish a pipeline of students similar to what we have, but again, building more so that students can come from high school directly into the post-secondary institution already having a very solid background um, in, a, in the STEM area of their interest. Legislation, there currently, is, there currently are many states, California, New York, Washington, Indiana, Iowa, and Michigan that have specific legislation incentivizing STEM programs. For example, one of them is a forgiveness program for students who graduate in education in a STEM field. Um, their, uh, any financial aid or any, any loans are forgiven. Or the opposite end, have scholarship opportunities for students uh, that are graduating in STEM fields. Um, mentorship and um, developmental, uh, profession, professional development opportunities as well for the teachers so that they can keep up to date with everything um, the most current information. Um, I addressed incentives and scholarships for students, uh, particularly women and minority students. And then again, building more opportunities for collaboration between the two-year and four-year institution by incentivizing outcomes of, of students that are successfully um, graduating in STEM fields. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Tanisha Ellis, the program coordinator for the Board of Regions, and I will be heading up the community engagement. As Vern did, I've established job discussing the current and ongoing activities we have across the state. We'll be doing the groundwork, like Dr. Rollo mentioned, from the first of three months, scanning the environment to see what else is out there. Some community initiatives, this is a small group, not all, um, for schools, corporations, for instance, Procter & Gamble offers STEM scholarships, Dow and Exxon, um, nonprofit organizations, there's a National Society for Black Engineers, they have a summer engineering experience for kids, and 4-H youth wetlands programs, also churches and other organizations and the individuals who host things on their behalf. The next thing we need to do is to identify regions with STEM with limited STEM initiatives. You will see an increase of STEM initiatives in southern Louisiana and, and as far up as Shreveport. But what about the middle, the more rural areas that don't have the Boys and Girls Club and other organizations to reach out to them? We'll also focus on populations being served, disadvantaged youth, minorities, and also young girls and women. Next, we'll analyze uh, the barriers that limit STEM participation. In some areas, maybe transportation, lack of resources, lack of parental involvement, or parents not understanding what STEM is and what the benefits may be. We'll also focus on, um, we'll focus on opportunities, opportunities to grow STEM participation and increase the STEM footprint in the state. Partnering with organizations, corporations, schools, and nonprofits to enhance 
what we currently what's currently being done and increase the occurrences of the events and educate parents through the identified groups on the benefits of STEM and ensure their comprehension of the of STEM. We'll, we'll uh, collaborate with um, workforce and overlapping businesses and industry initiatives and also collaborate with public affairs to assist with the marketing and, the, and community events. And again, as Vernon has stated, please let us know what is currently out there and how we can expand our footprint for STEM throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to uh, Dr. Vosper for workforce. She probably has more of the drop downs for those of you who know than anybody else. <laughs> Good morning. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, the workforce box, but we're really going to be thinking out of the box, but we're going to uh, put it out there. Um, Commissioner Rallo talked about in his opening comments uh, some of the data that's out there as it relates to the STEM workforce. One of the things I wanted to point out specifically for Louisiana's workforce data is that the workforce projections for our state indicate that approximately 67,000 new jobs and replacement jobs will need to be filled each year as the state's economy continues to develop. As he mentioned, of the jobs in Louisiana's occupational forecast, 40 percent of those of the total jobs are STEM or STEM related, and 58 percent of the uh, good jobs, we call good jobs, four and five star jobs are STEM related. I received some data this morning from the uh, STEM Connector, a project of STEM Connector. Doc, uh, uh, Senator Hewitt, you might be very interested in this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the mil Million Women uh, mentors. It is an organization. There may be the Louisiana representative may even be in this room, but I want. I received a, some information from them this morning that 71 percent of um, all of the American jobs. We've been talking a lot about Louisiana jobs based on our um, local forecast, but 71 percent of American jobs in 2018 will require STEM skills. And in the past 10 years, STEM jobs have grown three times greater than non-STEM jobs. In fact, 80% of the fastest growing occupations in the U.S. depend on mastery in mathematics and science knowledge and skills. So we have a real uh, uh, effort that we have to uh, push forward. The other thing that we are finding based on ACT's data that was released last week is that, and I think the commissioner mentioned this, that 10 percent of high school um, graduates are STEM ready and the jury is really still out on the STEMness of our uh, college graduates. So um, on the surface, there appears to be a very significant uh, STEM workforce readiness gap that we really need to address. And, the, and this uh, work group really is going to be working horizontally between the other work groups because at the end of the day, um, people aren't going to school to uh, just to learn but they're going to school to create a life and a future for themselves and their family. And so our workforce initiative will really focus on several items to address and investigate the gap and to explore strategies and opportunities to minimize the gap, particularly here in the state of Louisiana. We have a SIP to SOC work group that is already working. We want this group to engage with that, to talk more. And do, are, is everyone familiar with SIP to SOC? Uh, I see some head shaking. No, let me just tell you. Um, CIP, C I P, is the classification for instructional programs. It, uh, it is the codes that are used to aggregate and to, quali um, to segment out uh, college majors in a systemic way. So the C I P provides a code assigned to college majors. SOC, which is actually S O C. Um, is the standard occupational classification. It is used by federal agencies um, to classify workers into specific occupations. So when we take the codes of the, what is produced in terms of our college graduates, in terms of what's coming out of the majors, 
and we look at what the SOC occupations are in terms of what the need is, where there is a gap is where we, we're in that space trying to figure that out specifically for Louisiana. Other states are, um, are, are looking into the same work. Federal legislation is pointing to the fact that we have to be more diligent in, uh, in investigating this, and so we're making a full court press in that regard. We are also very interested in the work and want to celebrate the work of the Workforce Investment Council, new chairman, welcome, um, that ha has been going on with our star rating system. If you are not familiar with the star rating system that rates and cl the classification of our jobs in the state and our occupational forecasting conference, which identifies and projects job growth and develops uh, information on the needs of our current and future jobs in Louisiana, it is worth it to visit the Workforce Commission's website um, and the work that they're doing in that regard. But we're very interested in working with the Commission and with the uh, Council um, to look at uh, how to designate the, the occupations that are currently in our star rating job system or our occupational forecast as STEM related jobs so our easier sort can be done as we continue to press this work forward. Um, economic development, uh, uh, the, the Louisiana Economic Development and Fast Start in particular helped to shape a lot of the goals that we set for our um, workforce goals for the state of Louisiana. So we'll be working closely with them. Business and industry and corporate engagement. Tanisha has talked about that. Uh, Senator Hewitt has <coughs> talked about that. There is a real um, full court press that needs to happen for our companies to step up, particularly as we start getting into credentialing, as we start moving toward work-based learning opportunities, and for our students to, in to have practical work-based experience while they're still in high school and while they're still in college. We want to give them opportunities to have that practical, real life, valuable um, experience. And so work-based learning, um, credentialing, looking at our industry-based certifications and how we can either identify new industry certifications that need to come forward in the STEM field, et cetera. Then we have um, workforce and career counseling. We'll be um, looking to Louisiana Calling and some of the work that they're doing. We will not reinvent the wheel in these areas, but looking how we can seek out what is actually working and lifting up what is working. Um, uh, Dr. Burns talked about the teacher quality side of the K-12 uh, coin. We are very interested and very excited about the national recognition that our state's jumpstart program is getting under the leadership of Superintendent White. And we're very interested in looking at pathways to success for our students and how we can better align what's happening in post-secondary, secondary, and in the workforce across the continuum. <laughs> so um, we'll be looking at work in that area. And then um, the st uh, military workforce, women in the workforce, and diversity in the workforce is also, um, are also threads that will constantly go throughout the work that we do. I will tell you that STEM, we, we spent some time, I think earlier, uh, Senator Hewitt talked about uh, women, uh, the pay for women. But what is uh, interesting is one of the statistics that I read this morning is that STEM jobs pay women better than other jobs in every field. In fact, 92 cents on the dollar for the STEM workforce. So of course, as we're working across um, um, with the other work groups, the work that uh, Dr. La Madrid is going to be doing in the secondary and post-secondary, that secondary to post-secondary space, one of the strategies that we can definitely utilize in the classroom as we're trying to ascertain what's the challenges with why um, females are dropping out of uh, particular majors, they may not know about the 92 cents on the dollar. We want to make sure that they do know that they stick with it and they make the guys sit in the back of the class. So we're really excited about um, the work that will be coming forth in STEM. We invite you to join our work group. Um, we will be working with all of our partners collaboratively. We will be engaging others, perhaps not even in this room, that can bring some um, expertise and insight um, to this work. And we are really excited to be a part of it. Thank you. Oscar, and now we'll go on to uh, Mr. Godfrey, who will, who is ABD now, where is she? ABD.
all but this patient. So yeah. why do you say hopefully you'll soon be calling her doctor also? And she's been talking about In May, her. yes. Uh, thank you for that. I'm Nikki Godfrey. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Public Affairs for the Board of Regents. And I'll just quickly go through. I only have one slide. So uh, the Communications and Public Relations box uh, will really work through and with every other work group that you've just heard about. Um, we do cross uh, every group, whether that's the K-12 or um, our pre-K-12 or the higher ed or workforce our community. So our group will uh, work on efforts across the board. Um, we will focus mostly in the four areas that you see listed. And um, we do have a full marketing campaign. And thanks, we have a great communications manager, Brittany Francis, who you see taking pictures, uh, who's worked on a marketing campaign for La STEM or LA STEM or Louisiana STEM, whatever you want. So the first thing we'll be working on in our group is brand development. What is La STEM? Uh, what is our target audience? What messaging do we want to get out about the advisory committee and about your work? And how do we want people to see the initiative? So what does that look like in the community? What does it look like for the students? And what does it look like for other stakeholders out there? So that'll be our, our biggest charge in this committee. Um, we'll also work on media coordination. So whether that's advisories, press releases, thanks to my friend Wilson Tell from The Advocate for being here today. Hope he wasn't trying to hide, but thanks for him being here. Um, we'll work on interview requests and just, again, work with the media to try to ensure that we're disseminating information correctly and appropriately uh, and having that coordination. We'll work on event management most closely with Tanisha and her group with the community engagement. And that specifically in this box is what events does the Louisiana STEM Advisory Council want to host as an entity, what are we doing out in the community? And again, how do we want that to look? So we will have some event management um, roles and responsibilities inside of our box. And as well as um, what we're calling a calendar of statewide events. So this will be a massive undertaking because you've seen a taste of what's going on across the state as it relates to STEM. Uh, what the goal would be is, hey, where is that clearinghouse that if somebody wanted to know what was going on in a certain portion of our state that related to STEM, they can click and easily access information for the next month, the next six months out. So we're going to take that on and figure out what that looks like, but where can we have a clearinghouse of statewide events uh, that people can access for STEM? Uh, really our tree that you see on the right side, I touched on media. We have a lot of acronyms, so I would guess that most people don't know what COSP is. Uh, that is our Council of Student Body Presidents. So I'm the co-advisor, um, along with Harold Butte, of the Council of Student Body Presidents. So we have the student body president from each of the 32 institutions underneath the Board of Regents. And we meet as a body every other month. And so our thought is, how can those students who are on campuses across the state engage their campus communities? And what does that look like? So we will work closely with COSP as a group to uh, help them become advocates for this initiative as well. Uh, we'll also work with LASVA, which you're probably familiar with, um, and the student Office of Student Financial Assistance, and then Lewis, who I think Terry's back here, our new director of our Lewis Initiative, um, that's the Louisiana Online University Information System. I hope I got that acronym right, yes. Um, but those are other groups underneath the Board of Regents, and so again, the thought there is how can we utilize the, uh, the resources that we have to help spread the message? For example, LASVA has folks out in the community about 400, and I was going to say 400 days a year, but that doesn't make sense. But they touch about 400 touch points during the year in different parts of the state. So while Last End may not have anything going on in Dry Prong, Louisiana, sorry if you're from there, we just may not have anything going on, they're going out and speaking to students there about filling out the FAFSA or about TOPS or about, you know, whatever it happens to be. So while they're making those 400 visits to students across our state, what can we be, um, can be doing? What message can we be spreading? What can we put in the hands of those students while those visits are happening. And um, we also will work on a website. We have a preliminary site up right now that's linked through our Board of Regents page. You'll see a slider on the site with the uh, last STEM logo if you go there now. All of your pictures are up in um, brief bios. So we will be putting additional information, including this PowerPoint presentation, up on that site for now. And we'll keep it as updated as we can. Um, we're also on social media. So for you Twitter folks and uh, Facebook, we will be um, updating and sending out the last in messaging through our LA underscore Regents accounts on social media. So if you don't mind following and assisting and helping push messaging through there, we would appreciate it. But yes, that's our communications and public relations and we look forward to working with each of you.
Thank you. In the last box, uh, we, we were going to talk a little bit about fundraising. Mr. Dunn uh, talked a little bit about some of the large grants that we're going to do, but if I could just ask Senator Hewitt, maybe spend a moment or two, nothing a lot, on what you visualize in terms of some of the fundraising activities that we've talked about. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is pass the hat. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's fine. Um, well, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, as you know, this is a very difficult time for the state of Louisiana in terms of uh, finances. And, you know, I've been in office for 18 months now. We've been in six sessions, and every session is about solving the budget crisis. So this is not an easy time to be uh, trying to fund new initiatives. But I firmly believe that this is exactly the kind of thing that the state needs to be investing in to get ourselves out of the hole. So it's kind of a catch-22. To me, instead of always debating about cutting expenses and raising revenue, the real answer is about creating jobs and high-paying jobs like those in STEM. And so I'm really excited to see the passion. And, and the, I want to thank you, Dr. Rollo. I have the microphone and your team for the work that you've already done and the resources that you bring to this effort. And for those of you that are serving, this is a very high-powered group. And when you look at the opportunities that we have to cross boundaries and to put it all together in sort of a holistic way that makes sense, we can do some very powerful things here. So in the beginning, you know, I had to commit to getting this thing off the ground, and Dr. Rallo was kind enough to partner with me. I had to commit that I would not ask for state funding to launch this. And so Dr. Rallo was kind enough to volunteer Board of Regents resources, and you see the caliber of the folks that we have is tremendous, and their leadership is going to be valuable, and your participation is going to be instrumental in actually driving the direction that this effort goes. So in the beginning, you know, we're, I guess my thought, and you saw that in Dr. Rallo's timeline, is uh, you know, we have to figure out what is the product that we're going to sell before I can really ask you for money. So we will be looking at all of the best practices and things happening, and you heard a lot of the, the plans today in terms of direction from the different subcommittees. And at some point then, we will be, at the beginning of the year, developing kind of a strategy and a game plan and a roadmap for where we're going to go in the next six months, year, five years, ten years, and how we're going to measure this, our success in getting there. And so I think at that point we will be in a position to be able to say, we're going to do X, Y, Z, and I need your financial support to help me do that. And I hope that industry will be the first to step up. You know, many industries are already stepping up in their own geographic areas where they're partnering already with universities and high schools and community and technical colleges to grow the workforce that they need directly. And I believe that they will see tremendous value in the work that this group is going to do. And I hope that they will will join us in, in some funding. It may be direct contributions. You know, I've thought about we could do a big event, you know, and invite people to. And, but I, I do believe that industry will support us on this. Those of you that are here representing industry, you know, may have some thoughts on that. And I hope that you will um, choose to work with me uh, because I think, I guess I, I didn't really realize that until I saw the boxes, but I think I'm chairing the fundraising committee. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I hope that, that you will work with me. And again, we're not going to be standing out on a street corner shaking a can, but we're going to be able to deliver a very crisp message on what it is, the direct, what is the direction that this group is going to go and the workforce that we're going to deliver uh, that's going to help the entire state and our key industries. So we have to have the vision of thinking about what are the industries that already exist in our state, what are the industries that, that we see as growth potential and that we want to attract to our state, and I guess that's just me thinking, and then how do we get there? And so we're going to need some staff and we're going to need some resources and we're going to need people that are working and thinking about this full time because you all all have other jobs that you do and you're not going to be working on this full time. But we'll, we're going to need some full-time resources 
to be able to drive this. And so um, I hope that some of you will join me and we'll talk about the best way to do this going forward. Great, thank you. What I'd like to do now is, uh, really we have about 20 minutes, and uh, for those of you who know me, you know we will always get out on time. There's no question about that. But I, what I'd like to do is have an open conversation and really ask you to think about two questions. Are we asking the right questions? And number two, are we set up to achieve the outcomes that we all want? If you want to share a vignette, that's fine, but I really don't want to spend a lot of time this time. We can talk about success stories as we move forward. Right now, we're trying to set, if you will, the uh, the, the rules of the game so we can get to where we want. So those would be the things. I mean, whether it's visitors or people around the table, are we set up properly and do you think we're asking the right questions? Please. Thank you. you. Just tell us who you are, even though we have big, big signs here. Absolutely, yes. I think all of us have uh, increasingly aged eyes here. So I'm Susie Schoen with Louisiana Economic Development. I do want to compliment you on your incredible staff and the work that they put into this. It, it's really terrific stuff. I just wanted to comment on the fact that I think sometimes when we talk about STEM and the um, educational programs that lead to STEM jobs, we end up talking a lot about bachelor's degrees and above. And I think Lisa did an excellent job and some of the other folks did raise the question of uh, other types of degrees and preparation that lead to some of the best jobs in the state that are unquestionably STEM fields. They're highly quantitative fields. And I just wanna make sure that we really embed that into the K-12 and the higher education committees as well. Yep. No, and the idea of the, of the boxes were not to be mutually exclusive, it's just we're trying to get the entire array of issues and questions so there's a to use the old military term, is a belly button you can push and someone is responsible for that box, but doesn't mean that okay. they don't overlap. Please. Hi, I'm Randy Duran yeah. in the Office of Research and Economic Development. Um, I'm on the McKean Center at, at LSU. And I would like to enthusiastically join the effort of uh, <laughs> Senator Hewitt in funding, but add the notion that uh, uh, we may want to add their prestigious private foundations, such as the Ford mm -hmm. Foundation and others, um, many of our institutions have the resources to do research on those such that we uh, can look at them. And then the others is the strategic plans of our various institutions, um, uh, such as LSU's, that's just come out and features uh, a pledge to use our de development infrastructure. So I'm thinking that the, the various higher ed and K-12 institutions uh, um, we might do an analysis and see how we can partner such that we can get gifts from the community that align with each of those mandates uh, in fundraising, which is terribly important. All right. this. No, uh, that's good. And let me also uh, make a point that I've, I'm sure is it, it, in the minds of most people, but uh, you know, my wife's from West Texas, and she introduced me to this wonderful phrase, this ain't my first rodeo. I never heard that term before. Growing up in New York, you know, first off, you didn't have rodeos, but ain't my first rodeo. And one of the concerns I know is that, you know, is this initiative going to suck the air out of what I'm trying to do, whether in the corporate sector or the K-12 sector or the higher ed? And, and let me be, reassure everyone we're not trying to do that. What we're trying to do at the end of the day is to take initiatives that currently exist or that should exist and work them in a fashion that everyone benefits. It benefits to the, for our students, benefits our state, and so we're not trying to get into a competitive mode or whatever. So therefore, as you point out, a lot of people go after big grants, and we don't want people to feel we're gonna to try to take all that. We wanna to work together. So that's exactly the type of point that we're trying to do. Please. Um, my name is Mahir Muzika. I'm the provost and senior vice president at the University of New Orleans. I, I was a former dean of engineering as well. Uh, I want to echo Randy's uh, sentiment because STEM and women in engineering, women in sciences are also dear to us. In particular, for people like us who work on national security, there's a sort of shortage of STEM fields that work in the Pentagon and say other places. So we also like to pledge that we can actually contribute and help with fundraising or other issues because this is something we're doing anyway as part of what we're trying to grow the STEM fields here. Yeah, I think some, most of you know that uh, LUMCON, which is uh, the uh, Louisiana Marine Resource, uh, Research Consortium, which is uh, a Board of Regents initiative, but at the same time it is everyone, all the uh, universities participate. And we have the Pelican, 
which is a rather large vehicle. And to, to point out what you were saying about fundraising and opportunities, and obviously with my background, I told Dr. McLean, who is the uh, head of the, the uh, LUMCON, that the best way to get money is to weaponize the Pelican. You know, put some, put some 50 calipers on that thing, go out and get some grants. That's how you get a new Pelican. So I'm not being facetious, but you're exactly right. We need to move into that environment. Please. Oh, we have the corporate sector. Good. Sure. So, uh, Tom, you're at BASF. So, Senator Hewitt, thank you very much. I think this was, this is a great initiative, yeah, on your part. So thanks for taking the leadership. And then, obviously, for, uh, for John White and uh, Peralo, again, thank you all for your past leadership, right, in, in doing this. So to, to address one of your questions, um, you know, does, is this going to suck the wind out, right? Is it gonna do it? The answer is no, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion. So when I look at it, we're all busy doing lots of things. The question is, do we have a coordinated effort to do this? And, and this is where I see this simply taking maybe the next step of what the, the two of you uh, started when we looked at things like Jumpstart. How do? Uh, as corporate individuals, we were all meeting with education institutions, LEDs, and others trying to figure out how do we solve craft workforce issues. Right? Same meetings, same different locations, different people all the time. So I see this as a way, a vehicle to try to bring in, do a gap analysis on what we have today, where are we missing, and where do we have to find those unmet needs. So to me, one of the critical questions when you go through the, the different statistics of us being short in this category, short category, is why? Right, whatever we do, whatever efforts we double down on, whatever gaps we do, we really need to do it in a coordinated fashion that we believe we're addressing the root causes on why we're not the number one state for STEM education, STEM readiness, and STEM available citizens to take the STEM jobs. Please. William Wainwright. Uh, representing Louisiana Community and Technical College System. I serve as Chancellor of North Shore Technical Community College. Uh, I truly value the inclusiveness uh, that was mentioned several times during the presentation. And looking at inclusivity would simply state that while there is tremendous value in ACT uh, being a, a measure for STEM readiness, um, what does a measure for STEM readiness look like for someone who's incumbent to the industry or someone who's seeking a career change? What does a STEM readiness indicator look like for one of the, what, 600,000 individuals that are eager to participate in our workforce who are seeking high set? What do those other indicators look like? And I ask that as we continue to progress and we focus on inclusivity, let's look in addition to ACT um, at what those other possibilities are. And I'm glad you raised that because, I, again, I think most people are aware, but it, it bears repeating, that for us to achieve the goals in this state that we want, whether they're STEM or just economic, but let's focus on STEM, we need to bring adults back into the workforce. And uh, my numbers may be a little bit off, but that's okay. I mean, we have about 500,000 people out there who have um, perhaps high school, but, but beyond that, they don't have it and probably would like to get back into the workforce. And the way we're set up in the state with the way we fund things, you know, Pell Grants and Go Grants and TOPS, it really excludes this group. And so one of the questions that we'll be looking at is how can we reach out to engage those individuals, bring them back into an academic environment so they can be successful and achieve and then move into the industrial environment. That's a very important uh, notion that we have. I'm, I don't know if your voice is good or not, but I mean, I'm going to just turn to my colleague because we've worked on a lot of these things. <laughs> I'm going to reserve my comments because my voice okay, is no, good. Okay, no, thank you. Okay, well, I, I, you sound a little funny. I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> Other thoughts as we move forward? Please, way back there. Yes, please. Come on. Uh, maybe you come up to the table or, so we can. It's really hard. Some, this is the one of the least charming rooms that we have in the building. We selected it with no windows whatsoever, but. Okay, I'm Kim Fossey, and I'm from the Foundation for EBR Schools, which we've been working and tackling uh, STEM education for about the last four years. So we've learned a lot about some of the barriers that are keeping the Baton Rouge area kids from STEM. And, um, you know, after trying a lot of different things from mentoring to um, courses, dual credit courses, you name it, activities, events, challenges, competitions. We've come to the same conclusion that you have, that you know we don't have a concerted effort here in the Baton Rouge area. So as you look at solutions at the state level, 
you know, it will need to trickle down in terms of how do we build an adequate ecosystem in a regional or in an inner city locale. Because for us, and just like everyone else that has, has made some great comments today, this is fantastic. This excites me like nothing else ever has. Um, we, we, have to, we have to consider the, the whole continuum, which I wanted to bring up the issue of out of school time. You know, this is not just a K formal K-12 issue. There's a ton of um, time that a child spends with his or her own parent and family and out of school time providers um, that can provide such a rich addition to this particular piece. So I'm just here to say that we're excited. Our Baton Rouge has just joined the National STEM Ecosystem uh, Initiative, and we're taking a contingent of Baton Rouge people to their national um, convening next month. So we hope to sort of bring back a model for whatever you guys come up with at the state level, how can we replicate it at the local level so that we have an ecosystem that's powerful and is effective. So thank you. Thank you. And we've heard from Senator Hewitt, but Representative Hilferty from the other side of the house, would you like to? First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here. I mean, this is a really powerful group, and with things as complex as this, as far as, I mean, it sounds easy, you know, let's, let's get more people in STEM, but as, as we hear the layers of the, you know, and peel back the layers of this onion, we see that this starts at a very young age, and, um, you know, if we're not graduating people at 12th grade, we're not going to graduate them out of college, they're not going to get the jobs, and so the effort and the coordination needs to occur among all levels. So I commend um, Senator Hewitt for taking this very important first step in bringing about this commission. Um, I guess probably about a year and a half ago, I sent her an email and said, hey, this is an article on the fact that we need more women in STEM, and what do you think about it? And you know, then and you know, she said, well, let's work together on this, and, and that was incorporated in a part of the bill, so I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate Dr. Rollo's efforts and all of his staff and Dr. White's efforts. Um, this is not going to be an easy task by any stretch of the imagination. And, and to your point, uh, the woman that was just at the table, um, there are, this engages the community, this engages all of our employers, so I appreciate, you know, members from um, workforce development and lobby and some of our business organizations being here to be a part of this discussion because we obviously need your input across the board, whether it's mentoring a child in third grade to teach them how interesting science can be. Um, certainly the paycheck's gonna be a little more interesting to somebody in college, but to that third grader, you can do some really cool stuff with science. And showing them that, that's gonna be the spark that takes them to become that college graduate. Um, I don't wanna go on anymore. Again, I appreciate everyone's time and everyone being here and being a part of creating this solution for our state. Very important first step, thank you. Thank you. I think there was, please, go up right to left, please. Yeah, yeah. On my right, I'm sorry. You're <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Esperanza Zenon. I'm from River Parishes Community College in Gonzales. And I can definitely say we have some wonderful partnerships with industry. BASF is definitely one of them. We offer our, we're able to offer our BASF Tech Academy during the summer. And we invite uh, up to 40 high school student seniors to come to our campus for a week and we, um, we orient them to our campus and the uh, tech programs that we have. And then we take them out to various industry, industry sites where those skills are being used so that they can see a direct connection between the, the, the two-year college degree and uh, see a pathway to a job. So we take them out to places like NASA and we don't just do the gift shop we actually go out into the facility. We got, to get, we got to go out to launch pads. We got to see engines being built. They got to see the hands-on nitty-gritty of the kind of work that they would do in those high-tech, high-demand jobs. So that's a great partnership and, and an example that you know, many other community colleges can definitely benefit from. Um, but also on the, the, the pre-K spectrum, uh, I want to advocate uh, tapping into some of the national organizations that are doing great work at, at that stage. One of, those, one of the partners that I work with is the National Girls Collaborative Project. And they work um, in pre-K all the way up through 12, if you want to think of it that way, in terms of 
um, informal learning environments, uh, at the after school alliance projects, um, the citizen science kinds of projects, the science action club kinds of projects that engage students in that out of school time with STEM based activities and learning opportunities. Um, I also um, partner with the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. And one of the great things about that national organization is that they are doing the work to find out the reasons why uh, females and other underrepresented populations don't go into the STEM fields. And one of the key pieces that we're working with right now at River Parishes is through their uh, eSTEM2 grant, which looks at the micro messaging that uh, females and underrepresented populations are getting when they do attempt to go into those STEM fields, when they express interest, what kind of sometimes just basically outright messages they get and, and you know, they and discouragement, but sometimes the unconscious biases that we hold regarding their capabilities that come through in the way we interact with them. And so it's very important that, um, especially in a, in a setting where we can directly influence their choices, that we understand what's going on within us that would, uh, you know, inform how we interact with those females and underrepresented populations when they come to us and say, you know, I think I want to be a welder. And, you know, and, and, and inadvertently, the first thing that comes out of your mouth is, well, why would you want a nasty, smelly job like that? Without really thinking about what that message is saying to a young woman who's, who sees that as a real opportunity to move her family forward, for example. Um, so that kind of work is very important, and there are national organizations that are doing that work, and they are excellent partners with uh, sub-organizations in Louisiana that are seeking to do that work. Um, I had the privilege of working with Ms. Shawin several, uh, maybe a year ago, to, talk, to uh, host a seminar on uh, the success of the Jumpstart project in the state in terms of uh, getting women, uh, young la ladies through that, uh, you know, welding, uh, getting them into that welding pathway. Um, so I can't stress enough the, the, the need for knowing what, what is happening at a national level. Uh, a lot of those organizations are tapped directly into the policies that are being formed, you know, in the, at the national level. Um, NAEP has an excellent and exceptional policy wing that is uh, on a regular basis advocating for policies that are inclusive. But if you don't know what they're doing, then sometimes you, as we say, reinvent the wheel. So it's so important to know about, you know, on a national level, not just from a funding perspective, but from an actual action perspective in terms of outcomes. Great, thank you very much. And that's a good way to sort of end this section. Let me first off, Oh, please, yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you, especially uh, Senator uh, Hewitt for having me. I'm Calvin Mack of STEM Nolan. Just listening to everyone, I just want to make some comments because we ask, are we asking the right question? And for the last 25 years, I've been struggling with that same question, are we asking the right question? And pretty much the entire conversation today have really revolved around careers and jobs in STEM. And I have two sons who've been immersed in STEM since they were in, 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 in their mother's womb. And recently my, my seventh grader told me, Daddy, I don't want to be an engineer. So as an engineer, I said, how do I not lose my son? But I think that question from my son spoke to the question that we're struggling with here today. The question is, are we a commission to create people who otherwise can be career ready in STEM, or are we a commission making sure that everybody in the state of Louisiana is STEM literate. Because regardless of what you decide to do in the, in the 21st century, you have to be STEM literate. So I had to sit my little seventh grader down and sit him down and explain to him that all this stuff that we're doing in STEM is not to make him an engineer, but to make sure that he's able to communicate, make sure he's able to uh, think critically. He really lost me. He said, Dad, I might want to be a politician. I said, now we really need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> He <laughs> said I might be one on TV, but my point, uh, the point I made him, the, the point I made to him was that, son, you know, you have some gifts and everyone else has gifts. And what STEM is going to give you is the ability to uh, critically think, 
uh, to work in, in groups and collaborate. And that's what's going to give you the competitive advantage over the people that you're going to be competing against. So now at our STEM events, he's the one that come out and introduce the subject. I mean, he wants to know what we're doing. He, he's, he's very communicative. So I won't steal his dream for him, but at the same time, I have to make sure that he understands he has to be STEM literate in the 21st century. Now, I say that to say that every Saturday in America, there's a million kids playing football dreaming that they're going to be one of 260 mm -hmm. that get drafted and become millionaires. Every Saturday in America, we make sure as a nation that there's a million kids playing basketball dreaming that they're going to be one of 60 that get drafted and become millionaires. In this nation, we make sure that there's a million kids running track every Saturday dreaming that they're going to be the one one day to win a gold medal. Well, I want to work with BASF and Dow and everybody else to make sure that on Saturdays during out of school time, we have a million kids doing STEM, dreaming that they're going to be one of 14 million millionaires in the world or one of 1,865 billionaires in the world. So my point is that I think we need to broaden mm -hmm. our uh, discussion sure. to the community, not, not with us per se. We know what we're trying to accomplish, but the message that we send to the community must be one that the community can embrace such that they don't turn it off. Because there's a lot of dads out there and moms out there need to understand that why their kid playing that football, mm -hmm. we need that million also doing STEM. Great. Good. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. And let me uh, sort of wrap it up. First off, say uh, thank you, everyone, for both not just participating, being here, but also hopefully uh, gathering and, and joining us with the passion. Thank you both to Senator Hewitt and Representative Hilferty for uh, starting this legislation. A couple of housekeeping. Please make sure you turn your forms in. Uh, please sign up for the boxes outside, as many as you want. Uh, and at the same time, our next meeting is the October 18th. But let me always end with a story, a little uplifting story. My, my folks have heard this before, but I still think it's a great way. If you haven't figured out, I'm a very outcomes-oriented person, and this is going to be an outcomes-oriented group. And so I give you the story, which has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with the fact that I grew up in New York City, so you have basically a Catholic priest and a New York City cab driver who have both died and gone to heaven. And they're being interviewed whether or not they are going to be invited into heaven. And the uh, priest goes first and talks to St. Peter and says, uh, I've lived a good life, lived a godly life, worked with the poor. I believe I'm entitled to come to heaven. And St. Peter says, welcome. And he gives them, there's your new home. He gives them a modest ranch house. Cab driver comes up and says, I drove a cab in New York City for 40 years. And St. Peter says, welcome. And he gives him a mansion. So the priest is irate, walks back up to St. Peter and says, I don't understand what's going on here. I lived a good life, a godly life. I work with the poor. All he did was drive a cab. But he gets a better house in heaven than I do. And St. Peter says, listen, up here we are outcomes oriented. When you preached, they slept. When he drove, they prayed. Have a good day. <laughs>